This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire, and on today's program, we're going to talk about two very important realities that affect your life personally, the lives of all the people that you know and love, and society in general. The first truth is one which we've spent a lot of time talking about on the Paul McGuire Report, and that is the obvious truth, the fully documented truth, the truth based on a clear record of credible sources, historical references, quotes, and sources from firsthand um, reports, books, documents, etc., where the social engineers in our society and other societies clearly state what their objectives are and what they had in mind and have in mind for things like public education, the entire educational system, the mass media, the mainstream media, film, television, books, uh, music, whatever. They have an agenda in mind. And this agenda is something that you can't be free, by the way. You cannot be free spiritually, um, in any part of your life, you cannot be free unless you first know the truth. Now, this is something Jesus Christ talked about. Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If you do not know the truth, you cannot be free. You know, you can be saved, and you can go to heaven, because Jesus Christ also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He was talking about the fact that he is the only God, the only Savior, and it is only by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and becoming born again that we can truly be set free for all eternity, only after we're born again. But a lot of Christians want to be free, or they pretend they're free, but they don't want to know the truth. And that's an oxymoron. You can't have it. You can't have truth and reject the truth at the same time. If you reject the truth according to God's word from Genesis to Revelation, you go into captivity or slavery. That's why Jesus Christ said, I have come to set the captives or the slaves free. Now, The evangelical culture, which basically is the primary representation of Christianity in our world today, has embraced a series of of very grave spiritual eras. Or they have embraced false doctrines. They have not rightly divided the Word of God. And the cost, the cost to... Little boys and girls, the cost to you, the cost to families, the cost to our nation has been astronomical. Whenever you reject truth, especially the big truths, you make seismic seismic changes in our society. So this, this whole notion that somehow you can be free that somehow you don't need to know the truth in order to be free is so far into the Word of God that it is appalling. And then to pervert the Word of God, and that is what is being done. You're perverting the Word of God. It's a perversity in the eyes of God. A lot of Christians get all hung up about a select number of sins And I'm not saying these sins are good. They're sin. All sin is sin. All sin uh, creates death. And God is a holy God, and he will judge sin unless the price for sin is paid for. And that happens when you accept Christ as your Savior. But this idea among contemporary Christians and a lot of church movements in our society today that you can be completely ignorant and deprived of the truth And yet somehow you're going to be free, you're not going to be a slave, is utter nonsense. Now, here's where God's word gets perverted. When it comes to salvation, 
It is true. You need to know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you are only saved through Christ by faith, not by works, and that you have to be born again and repent of your sins in order to be saved. But that is the single most important truth that there is. But that does not mean that there is... Look, let's put it in the simplest way. We have the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It contains numerous passages in the Bible um, that tell us the truth about God's message of salvation through faith in Christ. Numerous passages in Scripture teach us that truth. But all of God's Word is truth. Every word in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is the inspired and inerrant Word of God. God and His Word are one. Jesus is the Word become flesh. In the beginning was the Word. All of God's Word is true, and all of God's Word is truth. So are we to only believe and accept the truths that teach us about salvation, which is, of course, of primary importance, but then just arbitrarily reject all the other, the, the, the thousands and thousands and thousands of truths contained in the Bible? Do we just reject all that truth? If God didn't want you and me and his people to know about all these truths, he would not have given us the Holy Bible, Genesis to Revelation. God has something powerful for us to learn and know in terms of truth. That it took him from Genesis to Revelation to, to just give us the basic, most important truths. And he doesn't expect us to ignore all the other truths in the Bible. He wrote it for a purpose. So any Christian who thinks it's permissible before God to reject all the truths in the Bible and just uh, believe the truth of salvation, uh, you know, to be blunt, they're crazy. And they're not rightly dividing the word of God, which displeases God greatly, by the way. So, in order to be free, not just free of your sins and free to have eternal life in heaven with God, but in order to be free in life, God has given us enormous truths designed to set us free, designed to keep us from going into captivity and slavery, designed to uh, make sure we're not slaves or captives. That's why he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Okay, so here is an important truth that we are supposed to apply. Every one of us who claim to know the name of Jesus Christ must apply these truths in our lives, not just the truth of salvation. So let's, let's start with the, the basic premises of the Bible. One of the basic premises of the Bible is that when God originally created Adam and Eve, they were created as eternal beings, sinless. They were given the supernatural authority to rule and reign over planet Earth, and they were, in effect, the kings and queens of planet Earth under the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. They activated the law of sin and death. They brought a curse into the world and the death force into the world, when they disobeyed God and ate of the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. At that moment, their bodies changed, their consciousness changed, the entire world, all of creation, radically changed as it was literally placed under a curse. The death force permeates everything, and fear and shame and disease and all kinds of sins, and the fact that their bodies were beginning to die were, were the byproduct of rejecting the truth. You see, whenever you reject the truth, God gave them a commandment. You open the door for a curse for the death force. 
And as a consequence of Adam and Eve's disobedience, Lucifer, who was speaking through the serpent that seduced them, Lucifer became the temporary god of this world. So this present world system um, is controlled by Lucifer and his fallen angels and those people who have chosen to serve Lucifer and Satan, especially those at the highest levels, who in exchange for their power and their position and their wealth, uh, serve Lucifer. So, as a consequence, we don't see the kingdom of God ruling on planet Earth right now, which is based on love, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. We see a Luciferian rule on planet Earth. Now, because mankind rejected the truth of God's word, that caused man and woman to become slaves. Slaves of sin, slaves of Luciferian uh, governments and empires, because when you scratch beneath the surface of the um, Babylonian Empire, Mystery Babylon at the Tower of Babel, or you scratch beneath the surface of uh, the Egyptian uh, Pharaoh God King system empire, or the kings and queens of Europe, or the Incans, or the Mayans, or any of the other empires, when you get right down to it, they all at their core are Luciferian systems, and they share a common um, formula. And the common formula of worldly governments drawing their power and knowledge from Lucifer and not God and his word, the common formula is you have an elite class of God kings or rulers or the scientific elite or whatever you want to call them, and they use various means to conceal the truth from the masses and then, because they've concealed the truth and knowledge from the masses, they are able to, to rule and reign over the masses because the masses have been programmed to believe that they're slaves and that their rulers are gods. And so, in most cases, the people who are programmed to be slaves don't even know they're slaves and they don't even recognize, they don't even have the consciousness to understand that what they, they think is work and everything else is really a form of slavery for the benefit of this globalist occult elite. Now, that's, that's like as about as basic as I can communicate it, as straightforward as I can communicate it. So what does that mean for you, your children, and your life? Well, first you have to know where you are. You're on planet Earth. I think we would agree about that. But we're also in the last days where, according to God's prophetic word, everything is coming to a climax. At some point in the relatively near future, Jesus Christ will return to the Earth. <clears throat> he will defeat Lucifer and Satan uh, at Armageddon. He will defeat all the nations that are coming against Christ at his second coming at Armageddon, and the one-third of the fallen angels will be sentenced into the abyss at Armageddon, and then Christ will rule and reign over planet Earth because he is the rightful owner and the rightful ruler. Jesus is Lord. He will make Jerusalem the capital of planet Earth, as Bible prophecy predicts. And a thousand-year millennial reign will begin under the rule of Jesus Christ, not under the rule of Lucifer any longer. So there'll be a massive change in power. So, remember, we stated the other day that in the ancient civilizations like Mystery Babylon, they used occultic methods to brainwash the people into believing that the elite were god-kings and that the people were slaves and the people were programmed in such deep deception that they didn't even know they were slaves, and that the duties they were performing were slavery. Now, as 
mankind became more of a technological, scientific society on a global level, uh, a number of things happened. And one of the things that happened was that the globalist elite, early on, actually for, for centuries, but specifically regarding America and Britain and France and Germany <coughs> and uh, Europe and in certain Asian uh, nations, etc., the elite uh, took control of the all education from kindergarten to Ph.D. level and the media and music and television and everything else. And they, through social engineering, propaganda, persuasion, uh, brainwashing, mind control, whatever you want to call it, they programmed the minds of many, many generations to think in a particular way, to believe certain things and to, to not believe other things. So if you go back, for example and study the history of, of modern U.S. education. And I, I deal with all this in my book, Mass Awakening. And I'm reading to you from page 227 of Mass Awakening. Uh, the untold history of modern U.S. education, The Founding Fathers, by Jamie Lee, on tabooblog.com. And Lee provides an excellent history of education. And uh, the history of, of modern education is, is outlined. So in the 1900s, John D. Rockefeller, one of the world's globalist elite families, occultic in nature, uh, uh, probably the greatest finan financier of global government and global government-related causes, John D. Rockefeller built his fortune very mysteriously by establishing a number of oil companies and generated, back then, he had, in the 1900s, John D. Rockefeller had amassed the equivalent of $663 billion in today's money, in which he established foundations and think tanks to help create what Huxley called the scientific dictatorship. And in his first mission statement, now this is documented, and it's in the words of J.D. Rockefeller himself, okay? So it's a quote from Rockefeller. And when he uh, wrote the first mission state statement uh, of the Rockefeller Endowed General Education Board. In 1906, he wrote this. Now, here are the words of Rockefeller. Quote, In our dreams, people yield themselves with per perfect docility, which means easy to manage, control, and submissive, to our molding hands. The present education conventions of intellectual and character education fade from their minds and unhampered by tradition which means re re religion, family, biblical morality, patriotism, we work our own good will upon a grateful and responsive folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into men of learning or philosophers or men of science. We have not raised up from them authors, educators, poets, or men of letters, great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, state, statesmen, and politicians, creatures of whom we have ample supply. The task is simple. We will organize children and teach them in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. Now, what Rockefeller is saying is their goal for education beginning officially on record in 1906, was, was not to use the educational system to raise up. It's, it's not that Rockefeller was saying people wouldn't become lawyers and, and writers and musicians and everything else. 
But he said the goal of education is not to produce uh, a high percentage of people. And especially even if people do venture off into these fields, their, their, their full potential, their full uh, knowledge and understanding of what's going on will be deliberately limited. As such, they may be lawyers or musicians or writers, but they will never write on the level, unless you break the mold yourself, you'll never write or think or communicate on the level of the great philosophers, uh, the great painters and musicians, the, the statesmen, you see. You, you, he, the purpose of education was to program generation after generation to uh, create generation uh, after generation of children who would be to, to dumb down, okay? I mean, that was the brutal uh, reality. Rockefeller's goal was to dumb down children so they could be feudal slaves and people will say, well, that you're exaggerating. Am I really exaggerating? In the New World Order, industrialists like Rockefeller created over 50,000 non-governmental organizations, and he and other members of the elite used the new science of scientific social engineering. Okay, social engineering is basically brainwashing. It's a polite term for it. Rockefeller used social engineering and brainwashing to sell new ideas to the American public through social propaganda campaigns by men like uh, communications experts from men like Walter Lippmann and Edward Bernays, the father of modern advertising and propaganda. So you have deliberately um, generation after generation that have been dumbed down. They may have the outward appearance of being intelligent. They, they may have uh, uh, a certain uh, degree of fluidity in their vocabulary that makes them superficially appear smart. But when you scratch beneath the surface, they're dumb. They don't know anything about anything. And that's right where they're supposed to be. So, you have program generation after program generation. Now, um, this technology has continued and be ha, has been perfected since really before 1906. So, for example, in 1933, Howard Rugg wrote a book called The Great Technology, and he outlined their plan to program minds. So I'm going to quote him from his own book. Quote, A new public mind is to be created. How? Only by creating tens of millions of individual minds and welding them into a new social mind. The collective, a Marxist term, by the way. Old stereotypes must be broken up and new climates of opinion formed in the neighborhoods of America. Through the schools of the world, we shall disseminate a new conception of government, one that will embrace all the activities of men. So he wants, he he says, we're going to program people to accept and accept an all-powerful government that will be a top-down authoritarian government that will regulate all the activities of men and women. That means in every single asset of uh, every single part of your life. Um. Through the schools of the world, we shall disseminate a new conception of government, one that will embrace all the activities of men, one that will postulate the need of scientific control in the interest of all people. So he is basically saying we're going to use scientific mind control to get people to think all the same and, and p- become part of this group think, this world brain, this hive mind, uh, and people will be dumbed down in order to accept it. So this kind of uh, mind control technology and sciences, it goes way back. In 1819, that's about 100 years, more than 100 years, after Rugg wrote his book, in Prussia, uh, 
there was a scientist named Pavlov, and he was the father of what was known as operant conditioning. And Pavlov taught, taught dogs to salivate in the expectation of food by the mere ringing of a bell. The concept of the Pavlovian bell ringing each hour of class comes from the theories on conditioning. I'm reading from page 230 of my book, Mass Awakening. I hope you caught that. Pavlov developed operant conditioning, where he taught dogs to salivate, um, to salivate because they were conditioned to expect food by the mere ringing of a bell. Now, notice that the school system, which rings a bell at every period, did you ever wonder why the school system or how the school systems of America and around the world came up with this concept of dividing uh, the school day into different periods of time and at each period and, and lunch break or whatever, there's the ringing of a bell? That just didn't come out of the blue. That just didn't come out of a need to communicate, uh, you know, to the whole school. It's easy to ring a bell. That's not where it came from. It came specifically from the operant conditioning uh, of Pavlov, the scientist, who taught dogs to salivate an ex- expectation of food by the mere ringing of a bell. So, too, the schools began ringing a bell in between periods, all right? And that wasn't just some innocent thing. It was just one of many, many uh, Pavlovian operate, uh, operate, operate conditioning methods, you see? That's mind control. It's, it's revealing that the school system and the educational system is, is not just some innocent, we're going to educate you. No, it's we're going to indoctrinate you. We're going to condition you like Pavlov's dog. And we're going to use very sophisticated social engineering techniques and scientific mind control to program your every thought, belief, and behavior. Now, an important component of this Pavlovian system was how it defined for the child what was to be learned, what was to be taught, and how long to think about it. And when a child was allowed to think of, and um, when a child, let me get my quote here right, from what this Pavlovian conditioning uh, was teaching the child, And what the child learned from the ringing of the bell was this. What was to be taught, how long to think about it, and when a child was to be allowed to think of something else. You see, it's a subconscious conditioning of the brain which programs your brain and gives your brain permission to think about certain things or not think about certain things for specific uh, time periods and, and, and the bell is the conditioning of, or the programming of your mind and what it can think about and for how long. So, uh, in 1814, Edward Everett was the first American to go to Prussia, where Pavlov worked, for a doctorate in philosophy. And for the next 30 years after that, that's back in 1814, uh, Countless numbers of Americans went to Germany to earn degrees in education. And those who earned degrees in Germany came back to the United States and controlled all the major universities. So they were trained also by the Frankfurt School, which were Marxist professors. So it was more than just Pavlovian conditioning. It was Pavlovian conditioning plus Russian propaganda. And when these Americans became educated in this in Germany, they came back into the United States and they were elevated. And they are the educators and and teachers who controlled all the major universities. 
They promoted the the concept that the state is the father of children, not the biological father. And that's where Hillary Clinton uh, got the name from her book. It takes a village to raise a child. You see, they are against the mother and the father. Notice that in our mass media, film and television, that there is very clear there has been a very clear, focused, long term attempt to destroy the traditional uh, Christian family unit for a long time. The the elevation of feminism, the attack on a strong male father figure. Notice that almost universally in television, the father is portrayed as a weak fool that nobody respects. That is a deliberate attempt to, to destroy the family unit by destroying the spiritual head of the home and, and deliberately programming kids to perceive him as an imbecile. That's a, one of the reasons why there's parents have so much trouble in the home. Now, uh, the other thing is, you have the promotion way back in the 60s of sexual promiscuity, uh, uh, the sexual revolution, where promiscuity, sleeping around, having affairs, was aggressively promoted. For what purpose? To destroy the Christian family. And now you, you are moving to a high-scale um, uh, promotion of uh, alternative sexual lifestyles of all kinds. And it's, it's, it, there's a strategic, uh, coordinated effort to promote all forms of sexuality. Um, and But the main agenda is to promote all forms of sexuality for the reason of making the need for a traditional family to be obsolete. You see, a state, like a socialist state, uh, a state that uses propaganda to control the masses, is far more effective when it gets rid of the family unit. And by deliberately promoting all these various lifestyles, I mean, we're, we're talking about the media is on super o- overdrive on promoting every kind of lifestyle except that of a traditional family. Okay? And that's brainwashing. It's propaganda. But the intent is to destroy the family unit, which is also the intent, by the way, of communism and the Frankfurt School of Marxists. So, you have to understand that. The goal uh, is to dumb down people so they don't even realize it. And you can see the, the effects of dumbing down. The millennials know nothing about anything. I mean, it, they're just like completely devoid of any historical information. How can they possibly vote? They deliberately have no knowledge of our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, American history, history at all. They have absolutely no conception about anything. And that is intentional. Because, you see, dumb people are easily ruled and brainwashed. People who have knowledge, knowledge is power, are very hard to brainwash and to use mind control on. Now, I want you to really embrace that truth and think about it. There are has been since you're, you were born, since before you were born, you, all children going through school through, and being exposed to the media and the culture, etc., there has been a widespread, powerful strategy to dumb you down so you have uh, an inferior b- ability Uh, to use critical thinking skills, to evaluate, to have perception, to analyze something in the light of history, because you know nothing about history. I'm not saying every one of you know nothing about history, but today the kids know nothing about history. A recent uh, survey of millennials said that, uh, like, the overwhelming majority of millennials had no idea what the Holocaust was or that it even occurred. That it is one of the... major events in recent history, okay? They have no knowledge of the Holocaust. 
and they have no knowledge of what ha- what uh, what the communist revolution in Russia and China did, and in uh, in, in uh, North Korea and other nations. The 250 million people that were killed and starved, lost all their freedoms, concentration camps, the National Socialism made of Hitler. They don't know anything about it. So they're ripe for the picking. So, so, so the agenda is to make the kids stupid and uh, uh, directly uh, um, program their minds to be almost like subhuman. By, by interfering with their neurological processes, by suppressing their right brain growth neurologically, and by, by actually amputating, if you will, I'm not talking about surgically, but amputating through non-surgical means parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, uh, the limbic system, uh, the left and right brain hemispheres, so that they cannot even think because they've been biologically made to be stupid. And, and, and then you're a slave your whole life. You see, this is very important. It goes back to what I said at the beginning of this program. Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free, and knowledge is power. And Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. If you don't know that you're a captive or a slave, if you don't know that there's a full-scale war of, of uh, social engineering and mind control and programming being directed to you, your children, and your grandchildren, if you're not aware of it, then you're just going to suck it in like a sponge and you, you will be dumbed down. But if you know the truth about it, <clears throat> it's only then that you can apply that truth and be set free from lifelong slavery, and be set free and not be a captive, and and be set free to fulfill God's destiny in your life. <clears throat> do you understand how important this is? And do you understand how, why I'm so passionate about this? This is everything. You can't fulfill the Great Commission. You can't win souls to Jesus Christ. You can't bring in the last day's soul harvest. You can't occupy the land until Jesus comes or to do kingdom business until he comes if you um, allow yourself to be dumbed down by people <clears throat> who are a byproduct of a Luciferian elite structure or your kids and grandkids have been dumbed down. Do you understand how important? I mean, this is, this is life and death. But you, I never hear this discussed in a church. I never hear this discussed in church circles or among Christian adults. Never. And to me, I apologize, I apologize if I offend some of you, but to me, the lack of conversation about this most serious issue, I think about it. What did Jesus Christ say? say? Think about this, you know, all this mumbly goop I hear uh, the Christian, you know, mumbly goop words that mean nothing. Look, let's, you know, what would Jesus do, okay? Let's ask, that's a popular uh, phrase in the Christian culture. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus sit by idly and allow generation after generation who he created bursting with potential and gifts and talents? Would Jesus sit by idly and allow their minds to be destroyed and to be made stupid uh, and, and to program their minds to, to, to be slaves? Would Jesus sit by idly? Is that love? Let me ask you this question. Is that love? Many of you need to get off your posteriors. No, I'm dead serious. And you may be offended for a moment, but when I quote you or make reference to a passage of Scripture of the words of Jesus Christ, I think you will, uh, I think and I hope you would think that the, the, the tenacity of my words and the aggressiveness of my words is appropriate. So before you render judgment on me, let me just say this. Sitting idly by and doing nothing while your children and yourself and your grandchildren and generation after generation have been programmed to be slaves by a globalist elite 
They've been programmed to be dumbed down, which robs them of their God-given abilities and God-given gifting, both natural and spiritual. Does Jesus just sit by and look the other way and daydream and think of the uh, the, 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 the baseball scores in, in the NBA or uh, the football scores or talk all day long about, you know, what team is doing what or uh, whatever, you know, trivial pursuit you're involved in. I'm not knocking sports. I'm just saying if sports is everything, then sports is an idol. So what did Jesus say to us, to me and you? He said, it would be better for you. I, you know what? I'm, I want to read this directly from the Bible. It's just too important. I, I want to drive this home with the Word of God accurately and with precision. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. In a second, I'll come back to you with this verse, which I believe will, will shed enormous light on what we're discussing. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. By the way, you can visit paulmcguire.us for all kinds of free resources, including our Roku channel with, uh, I guess, just a whole lot of hours of uh, broadcast quality uh, television uh, recording of me uh, speaking uh, and giving prophecy messages, Bible teaching, speaking at conferences, and just, I don't know the total amount of hours, but it's a huge number of hours, all for free. If you go to paulmcguire.us and then connect on Roku, and the name of our channel is Paul McGuire Ministries. Okay, back to this uh, principle that, that Jesus Christ taught us about, okay, and it is the driving force behind the passion by which I'm communicating to you. Okay? So Jesus Christ said these words. Most of you are familiar with what he said. In Matthew 18, 6, Jesus Christ said, But whoso, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he was drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, that is an intense uh, statement by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is communicating to every one of us that if we are guilty, and, and let me define guilty, you can be guilty by directly being involved, uh, what they would call the sin of commission. You're, you're involved in, in some form of education or, or somehow you open the door by failing to, to guard not only your children but other people's children. And because let's, let's say you fail to ever speak up about it or you failed to ever do anything about it, you are really who Jesus is talking about because you participated. Um, I, it may not be, it may have not been your intention, but you're going to be held accountable for it. It says, whoso shall offend one of these little ones, children, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Well, let's, not, let's not do a cruise control, you know, by this verse. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's take this verse, it's the word of God at face value. If you are responsible through your action or lack of action in causing a child or a little one who believes in Jesus, who believes in God, to, to stumble or to be offended or, or to reject or to stop believing in God. Jesus says it, were, it would be better 
for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he, he was drowned in the depth of the sea. So if you're responsible by a lack of action or by wrongful action in causing a little one or a child who has faith in Jesus Christ, in God, but because of your action or lack of action, you contributed indirectly or directly to that child losing his or her faith, Jesus gives all of us a warning. It would be better for him that a millstone would be hanged around his neck and that he would be drowned in the depth of the sea. What do you think Jesus Christ means by the intensity of those words? Jesus Christ is showing us what is in his heart, in God's heart. What would Jesus do? Jesus is revealing to us in this verse not only the truth of the situation and the truth of the consequences, but in this verse, Jesus Christ is indicating to us just how passionately, just how deeply he loves the little children and the little ones and how precious they are to him. And if they uh, were raised in a Christian home or exposed to the faith and they are believers in him, believers in Jesus, and somebody comes along, okay, who, who takes that faith in God or belief in Jesus away, Okay, by by teaching him that, that there is no God or opening the door for that child into a dangerous environment where they force him or her uh, through social engineering or whatever to stop believing in God. Now, wh- what does Jesus say the consequence would be to those people who caused it by their actions or uh, caused it by their lack of action. In, in, in the heart and mind of Jesus, Jesus says, these people are going to experience a very heavy-duty day of accountability. And don't think that, oh, well, I'm saved, so I'm not going to be accountable. I mean, you'd really have to bend the, the Bible backwards and forwards to come up with a, a, a flimsy excuse like that. Yeah, you're saved and your sins are forgiven. But guess what? If you bothered to read the entire Bible, you and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ where we will give an accountability for this kind of thing. And it can be intense. The the fire of God is going to uh, uh, scrutinize and, and, and sift through our lives And if our lives are built on wood, hay, and stubble, this is worse than wood, hay, and stubble. This is actual, actually an offensive, hideous sin before God. You're going to be accountable. And if you are saved at the end of the road, uh, you'll be like a man or a woman who, who jumped out of their burning house right before they were going to be burned to death. Now, that's why Jesus says, it would be better for you that a millstone uh, was hanged around your neck and that you were drowned in the depth of the sea. So whatever the consequences are for uh, causing a child to stop believing in the Lord Jesus, they're huge, according to Jesus. So this this reflects how intensely God is committed to protecting young children. Okay, now let's get that fixed in our mind. That's the Word of God. There's no wiggle room around it. This is why I am passionate about this. Now, okay, so let's bring this into practical realities. If you and I, by our silence, our indifference, our lack of prayer, our lack of commitment uh, to be involved with ministries that are trying to do something about this, um, we, we're, we're either in one of two places. And, and it's not going to be an excuse before God, by the way. You need to tell this to your friends. I'm telling you right now, this program is one that you need to distribute as far and wide as possible to as many Christians as you know. 
because this is a subject that is dear to the heart of God. And it, it, it's a wake-up call to every believer. And most believers don't realize that they're going to be held accountable. And, and, and more importantly than that, Jesus is not happy at all with, with our um, uh, apathy in allowing this to happen. So you need to spread this message far and wide. And you can go to paulmcguire.us, that's paulmcguire.us, and there are multiple ways you can send a link of this program, this specific program, uh, to your friends and people who need to hear it. And you need to get on it. I don't think I've ever said this uh, to this degree of intensity in the entire time I've been doing the Paul McGuire Report. This is is mandatory. Okay, You're either going to accept responsibility or you're going to reject responsibility for it. And it involves their children, their grandchildren, your children, grandchildren, the children and grandchildren of others. Okay, so once we're aware of the fact that the public educational system and the mainstream media, etc., is strategically and deliberately using all kinds of psychological tools to, to cause our children to stop believing in God, social engineering, whatever, then you need to be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. You see, the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go when they're young, and when they're older, they will not depart from it. But you see, by allowing your children to be trained up or educated by a system which is opposes God and intentionally is trying to remove any belief in God out of your children or grandchildren, you are putting them in harm's way. And, and, and here's the data to prove it. Eight out of ten kids who were raised in evangelical, Bible-believing homes leave or reject their faith in Jesus Christ by, by the time they enter college or by the time they're halfway through college. Eight out of ten evangelical kids raised in Christian homes, reject their faith in God by the time they enter college or they're halfway through college. Now, that is exactly what Christ is saying. What caused them to stumble? What caused them to, 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 to steal their faith? They were put in an environment which is designed to destroy their faith in God. Everything from um, a teaching of evolution, which... The, the, the real agenda behind evolution is to teach your child that the Bible is not scientific, only crazy people believe in it, uh, and we have scientific proof that the biblical account of creation is totally a fairy tale, and that the Darwinian evolution, which says man came from random chance and he evolved randomly over 500 million years. That is the unquestionable scientific truth. So what you're doing right there, once you've embedded that belief into their hearts and minds, you have taken the axe and chopped off the head of any relationship to God because you've allowed them to be programmed to believe that Christianity is not scientific and that the mythology of evolution is true. And there's a hundred other ways they attack and undermine faith. Far more subversive. Now, Jesus hates this. So, what is the responsibility of every Christian parent? What is the responsibility of every Christian? Whether you're a parent or not, and, and grandchildren and so forth. We all have a responsibility to all the children in schools. Okay? That they... That they not be under assault uh, and, and, and be vulnerable in a hostile environment where no matter how much everyone smiles and pretends to be nice, there's an agenda set in stone to rob your kid of their faith. And any teacher that doesn't know about it, which is most, it's because they never bothered to self-educate themselves. Okay? 
I mean, I have quotes for you from the people who created the educational system. Their own words saying that's their goal. I have it in Mass Awakening. You need to get a copy, and you need to show them the quotes, or know the quotes, for crying out loud. And I talk all about this in Conquering the Matrix. I talk about, I give you quotes, I give you the methodologies they use, and most importantly, I talk about their plan to, to destroy Christianity and the hearts and minds of children in Mass Awakening. But in Conquering the Matrix, I, I, I expose the techniques, uh, the manner in which they do it, and I offer up solutions on how you can break that trance state, that mind control, that social engineering off your children and free them up from the lies, okay? So, let's read from a booklet. See, now, now I want you to know this uh, quote because there is, you know, the books that I write contain just a, a small percentage of the quotes are out there. We could fill a public library of, of volumes of books with quotes and data and first-hand credible uh, sources and publications and all kinds of information that documents exhaustively the proof that there is an intentional plan to destroy the faith uh, in children regarding Christianity and Jesus Christ. And it's been a long-term plan, beginning in uh, the early, early 1800s up to the present moment. So, uh, I want to read... Okay, I've said in other programs that uh, Julian Huxley, the, the brother of Aldous Huxley, who talked about the scientific dictatorship and authored Brave New World. Julian Huxley was the head of the United Nations UNESCO, okay, which is the global, standardized, humanistic education of the United Nations, designed to indoctrinate and program children in every school system in the world with Common Core, because Huxley invented Common Core, uh, and the purpose of Common Core was a common global education to program kids for a world socialist state in which there was no Christian God or Christian morals. All right? Okay, so in, uh, in a publication from UNESCO, there was a series of uh, nine volumes published entitled Toward Understanding. And, and in these volumes, called Toward Understanding, uh, they instruct kindergarten and elementary grade teachers in the fine art of preparing our youngsters for the day when their first loyalty will be to a world government of which the United States will form only an, an administrative part. Now, this is uh, from two, page 231 of my book, Mass Awakening. And then, uh, this program is very specific. The teacher is instructed to begin by, listen, care, listen carefully, this is intentional. The program is very specific. The teacher is to begin by eliminating any and all words, phrases, descriptions, pictures, maps, classroom material, or teaching methods of a sort causing his pupils to feel or express a particular love for or loyalty to the United States of America. You heard that. You got that, right? Um, uh, children exhibiting such a pre prejudice, in other words, children who are resistant to accepting this world socialist uh, godless state. In other words, children that were uh, raised with Christian beliefs, children that were raised to be patriotic uh, to our nation, um, they are, uh, in a sense, the enemy of this educational agenda. 
okay, and they're to be identified by the teacher and the school system uh, be- because of their patriotism, because of their Christian values, um, and and it is blamed on their home influence or their father and mother in the family. That's why they want to destroy the family. UNESCO calls it outgrowth of the narrow family spirit. So, you see, a family unity, a loving family, a Christian family, they're, they're trying to bend their minds of the kids, and, and they call that kind of family the narrow family spirit. Okay, that's like a prejudicial statement. They, and l- listen to this. They are to be dealt an abundant measure of counter-propaganda at the earliest possible age. Now look, we just read that Jesus said it would be better that a millstone was tied around, uh, better that uh, a rope and a millstone connected to a millstone was uh, tied around your neck and you were thrown in the sea and drowned if you were one of the causes for a child, a little child, losing their faith, losing their belief in God. Okay, that's what Jesus said. And now I am reading to you, not from my own opinion, uh, the quotes that I have listed in my book, Mass Awakening. I am reading to you what this global uh, educational system through UNESCO, what their plan is by their own words. Now listen very carefully, because it affects everybody you know, every parent you know. Um. Any child that that indicates that they have a patriotic belief or or loyalty or love for America, any child that believes in Christian values above humanistic values or has a belief in God rather than a belief in evolution, according to the, the plan of UNESCO, these children are to be dealt an abundant measure of counter-propaganda at the earliest possible age. Booklet 5 on page 9 advises the teacher that, quote, the kindergarten or infant school has a significant part to play in the child's education. Not only can it correct many of the eras of home training, what they mean is homeschooling, but it can also prepare the child for membership at about the age of seven in a group of his own age and habits, the first of many social identifications that he or she must achieve on his way to membership in the world society. This is terrifying. So this is an attack on children. This is designed to destroy a child's faith in God. And yet we have silence and ignorance from most Christian leaders. The average Christian parent is silent, ignorant, completely unaware of all this. And because of their lack of knowledge, because they do not know the truth, their children are being led into captivity or slavery, and their children and grandchildren are being programmed not to believe in God. Now, if first of all, you're responsible if you don't know the truth when you could have gotten the truth. You chose. You chose. You need to tell this to your friends, man. You chose to, to keep the truth away from you. You chose not to self-educate yourself because it wasn't important to you. It wasn't important to you? Try saying that to Jesus. When he, when he reminds you of a statement that anybody who causes a little one to lose their faith in God, it would be better for them that a millstone would be tied around their neck and they would be drowned in the sea. You are responsible for asserting yourself and pursuing truth. Not just the truth of salvation, but the truth of in every area that God in his word deems important, and any area that Jesus deems important, and Jesus clearly deems this one of his greatest priorities. 
So you got all these Christians. I meet them all the time. They sing in the choir. They do this. They do that. But they don't have a clue, and they don't want to know, by the way. You know why they don't want to know? They don't want to know because then they will be responsible. Then they'd have to do something. But that, that's not going to fly at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, because God says in the book of Proverbs, among many, many other places in his holy word, that God's people, that's you and me, we are to pursue knowledge, wisdom, truth, understanding, and guidance with such a passion. We're to pursue the truth and knowledge and understanding with such an aggressiveness, with such passion, just like we would pursue uh, the acquisition of, of precious jewels, gold and silver. Okay, God expects from us a tenacity, a passion, a drive. And what is this drive based on? It's not based on self-centeredness. If you're, you say you're born again, is that correct? You say you're born again. You say that you're filled with the Spirit. Oh, really? You're filled with the Spirit. Okay. And you say you're born again. All right. Let's assume that's true. So, Jesus Christ lives inside of you in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit also uh, counsels us, directs us, comforts us, helps us, but also convicts us of sin. And you're telling me that in your entire life, and, and I'm talking to people who have raised their children or are just starting to raise their children, that that you not once began to question what your child was being taught in school? I mean, come on, that's not going to fly. I've never met a parent. I've never met a parent who didn't question what was being taught to their children. But But the vast majority of them question it, and then go back to sleep. They don't do anything about it. The information is there if you're willing to read a book, if you if it was important to you. So you're going to be held accountable, okay? Because it's the truth that sets you free. You have to know the truth that your child is being subject to social engineering. That's very sophisticated. I just read you a quote. This isn't, a, this isn't like, a, like, like, you know, paranoia. This is like reality. I'm I'm reading again from Mass Awakening. John Dewey, who's the father of modern education, 1859 to 1952, was trained in communist Russia, and he was called the father of the progressive education movement in America. Dewey's goal was to transform public schools into indoctrination centers to dumb down students who could then be controlled by the elite. He promoted groupthink and the socialist idea of the collective. The role of the individual mind and thinking outside of the box was to be destroyed. Man, I don't know what to tell you, okay? So, when I talk to you about the importance of growing your mind, self-educating yourself, uh, doing what it takes to to gain knowledge and truth. God commands us to do that in Proverbs and many other places. So we are all accountable for God by God. And God expects us because he gave us a brain to use it. We're supposed to do a little bit of detective work, not much. It's called like read a book once in a while. Self-educate yourself. Get up to speed, whatever you want to call it. And part of your responsibility, again, is to get off your posterior and make sure you put this information in the hands of as many people as you can, specifically Christians, so that they're aware of what's going on. You can't make them do something about it, but at least you can educate them and exhort them in love, not passivity, to get involved. Because we are in a fight for the lives of our children, okay, on so many levels. And the the central game plan of the globalist elite, the scientific dictatorship, or whatever you will, is to dumb down your children. Now, it's not only to dumb down your children and 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 program their minds, it's designed to remove faith in God, remove belief in the Bible, but it's also designed 
to dumb your children down so that they are don't know they're slaves, uh, don't know that the duties they're doing are the duties of slaves, and to to deliberately shrink their brains, shut down the circuits to their creativity, their talents, their gifting, their abilities, their knowledge, their wisdom, their power. They, the, the purpose of education is to neuro, neurologically reprogram your child's mind so that they find it next to impossible to activate all the centers of their brain which would enable them to achieve the vision and the dream and the callings that God has placed in them before the beginning of time. Now, fortunately, if you're willing to self-educate yourself, knowledge is power, there are so many things you can do that even though you may have failed in many areas, okay, so you repent of it. You, you repent of it and you admit ownership to your failure before God. We've all failed in this area. But then... You don't stop there. Because if you're willing to pursue knowledge, if you're willing to cry out uh, to God for wisdom and understanding, as he commands us to, if you're willing to self-educate yourself, that means you read books that turn your brain on and activate your vision. You can learn that there are powerful tools in the human brain that God built into the human brain, there are powerful tools, God-given tools that we can use that actually match up with science that can undo the damage done to our children. In other words, just because you were dumbed down, you don't have to stay there. You can, at any moment you choose, if you bother to educate yourself, you can boost your brain power. You can enhance your IQ. You can give yourself super intelligence. You can reactivate your perception. You can live in a higher level of consciousness, intelligence, mental processing, decision making. You can activate neurologically the right brain, the left brain. You can, you can use nutrition and vitamins and exercise and rest and um, certain disciplines of the mind uh, your mind, because it's God created, has the power to be, in a sense, born again, both in a spiritual sense, but also in a neurological sense. Just because you were programmed to be stupid, just because you were programmed not to believe that you could ever utilize your talents and abilities, you can deprogram your children and yourself from the slavery that was never intended for you or your children or grandchildren to live in. Let me say this again. If you will bother to get off your posterior and not accept and not say to yourself, because it's a statement of unbelief, it's impossible, but say to yourself, all things are possible with God. With God, nothing is impossible. And if you will pursue with diligence and educate yourself as to how, because it's simple, you just have to do it, how to turn on your brain, how, how to increase your intelligence, how to release your gifting, your talents and abilities, how to, to realize your maximum potential. Just because it was stolen from you, just because you were programmed to be dumbed down, guess what? The good news is, through the power of God, the Word of God, and understanding scientific principles that uh, synchronized with the Word of God, you can deprogram yourself from being dumbed down. And using the Word of God and using the principles in God's Word, you can participate in re, uh, renewing your mind on every level. So if you think you're a loser, you can be a winner. And, and that's simplistic. But the sky is really the limit. And that's the wonderful thing about God. He gives you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. I don't care if you fried your brains out with crack cocaine or crack. Okay, I don't care if you drank yourself into oblivion. I don't care if you uh, had, uh, uh, what, are, what are kids like? It's the, uh, I don't know, it's the noodles with the cheese and the milk. It's, you craft in the packet. I forgot my kids had it all the time. But if that's all you eat 24-7, you're going to be dumbed down. 
You can reboot your brain, baby. You can activate all the apps that God placed in your mind since the beginning of time. You can activate them all. And guess what? When you look for them, you'll notice that there are thousands of icons in your consciousness, in your brain, in your inner man or woman that give you an indication as to what you're gifting, your calling, uh, uh, your abilities are. All you've got to do is activate the apps that God put in you and not accept the lie that you don't have any apps. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. We'll be back in a moment with more truth about how you can turn your life completely around and that of your children and grandchildren. This is Paul McGuire, and you are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. The wonderful thing about God and the way he created our minds is that just because the evil one, through his Luciferian systems and educational systems and uh, other methodologies of programming your mind and your children's minds, that this can all be undone with the truth. The truth can set you free. You, you don't have to be stuck in a box that somebody else created for you to live in. You have to, to understand that God created you to live as a free person and not a slave. So you've got to think outside of the box. The box is your conditioning. The box is your program, programming. You don't even realize how many times you tell yourself that something can't be done or it's impossible or whatever. We're all uh, vulnerable to this. Most of it's stuck in our subconscious. But when we renew our minds with the Word of God, we recognize that we are individuals created in the image of God. And as men and women created in the image of God, not, not accidental uh, m- monkeys that evolved into humans, what nonsense. We are packed with the potential and the gifts and the software and the apps that God downloaded into each one of us before the beginning of time. Because what the Bible teaches us, and it is scientifically true, that you and I are created in the image of God. And as men and women created in the image of God, he created them both male and female. But to be created in the image of God means that we reflect many of the characteristics, the abilities and giftings of God. We're not God, but we have been downloaded with many of his giftings. We're we're made after his image. He's a creator, capital C. He's the infinite personal living God of the universe, which means he's super intelligent. Well, the, the least we can do is be intelligent. Because God made it possible. We can renew our minds. Plus, he will give us, through the power of the Spirit of Wisdom and the Holy Spirit, if we ask him, he will give us supernaturally wisdom and enhance our minds. So, we can go way beyond what we've been programmed to believe uh, regarding ourselves. Now, one of the greatest dangers when you're dealing with young minds, and even adult minds, is you pressure people, you brainwash them, into thinking that, you know, there's something wrong with them, they're limited if they think outside of the box. Now, I just want to review something with you, and it comes from the life of Albert Einstein, the famous physicist, one of the super geniuses of all time, and other great thinkers in history. Did you know that Albert Einstein couldn't speak? He couldn't speak until he was four years old. And Albert Einstein couldn't read until he was seven. Albert Einstein's parents thought there was something wrong with him mentally, okay, like like he was retarded or something. The, the, The teachers thought the same thing. In fact, one of Albert Einstein's teachers described him as mentally slow, having no social skills, and, and uh, they, he, the teacher accused uh, Einstein of, of being uh, uh, a kid who, whose mind would wander uh, into, into foolish, ridiculous dreams. Think about that. What 
they are doing, his parents and the educators were doing, is by what they told him he was. If he, he, if he accepted that and didn't break the mold that they intended to place him in, he would have become what they said he was. He was expelled from school and refused to be accepted at the Zurich uh, Polytechnic Institute. Now, as time went on, he did learn how to speak and read. And he began to even do a little math. Prior to that, he couldn't even do, you know, 2 plus 2 equal 4. So, that's very interesting, isn't it, Around, about Albert Einstein? Now, take there are many Albert Einsteins today, not necessarily gifted in physics, but if you're gifted at a superior level, genius or close to genius or just super intelligent, you can be a genius not just in physics, there's endless areas you can be a genius in. But they, they, they wrote them off. You know what they would say today? Oh, your, your child has a learning disorder. That's what they would say today. And then they would make up a name for the learning disorder. And then they would say, uh, your child needs this medication and that medication. Look, I'm not against medication when it's needed. So don't, don't misread what I'm telling you about. I'm not against medication when it's needed. But there's a little too quickness to, 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 to use those words that he or she has a learning disorder or they have this and that and then just use a whole bunch of drugs on them. It's just a little too, uh, it's irresponsible for crying out loud. So today they would say he has a learning disorder. Albert Einstein, I don't know what they would have said. ADD, I don't know. ADHD, who knows? They've got a million names for learning disorders. And they would have given him a drug or multiple drugs. Now, could it have been that the reason, first of all, Albert Einstein was given by God an exceptionally brilliant, genius-like mind. Think of his mind like, like a sophisticated sports car, okay? Um, they have to be carefully tuned to maintain their performance. They're not like buying a Ford or a Toyota or something like that, which can be good cars, but they're not high-end performance cars. So a high-end performance brain might need some uh, uh, adjusting and some uh, uh, work with it because it's so incredibly powerful. Uh, Einstein had a powerful mind. So if the teacher and parents are used to dealing with students who have average minds and they don't recognize that one of the manifestations of what they're saying are learning disorders are really indications that Einstein had the genius-like ability to think outside of the box and to think about things on a far, far higher level such as E equal MC squared and physics and multidimensional realities and all kinds of things. You see, they didn't, in their evaluation of Einstein, how come they didn't uh, see any of his gifting? How come when they were evaluating Albert Einstein, okay, they called him subnormal, mentally slow, you know, a guy who couldn't control, who couldn't pay attention, adrift in his foolish dreams. Okay, now, let's do the math here, okay? These, the teacher, the school system, the parents are not professional educators, but they bear responsibility. If you're evaluating a student, and you really are evaluating that student effectively and properly, the methodology of your evaluation should, without exception, produce a reliable perception and measurement of any student's abilities and strengths as well as their weaknesses. That's just a fact. If your evaluation process and the way it's created and the methodologies it uses to arrive at a decision about a young child's brain power and mental gifting, 
And you have before you one of history's greatest geniuses, and you have before you one of history's greatest minds and most brilliant intellects in the history of the human race. And the school system, the parents and the teacher, cannot recognize that despite the fact that he has flaws, he obviously has other attributes that are so far beyond the average student that you would have had to have been deaf, dumb, and blind not to notice all the signals that you were dealing with a super genius. So the indictment is not against Albert Einstein. He may have been daydreaming because he was incredibly bored with the insepid, stupid educational uh, school sessions he had to go to. I mean, you're talking about a super genius. Is, is a super genius going to be uh, able to pay attention in, in a classroom that's designed to dumb you down? No, a, a super genius is going to daydream. It's, it's, it's his way or her way of thinking outside of the box. So if you really knew what you were doing, you claim to be an educator, you claim to be a school psychologist, you claim to be an expert in learning disorders, but with all your methodology and testing, you fail to see the genius in all the other Albert Einsteins or the intelligence and the gifting. If your method of scrutinizing students never uncovers the reality that the kids that you are diagnosing as inferior mentally or having learning disorders are in fact not inferior and they are super geniuses or geniuses, guess where the problem lies? It doesn't lie with the student. It it, it lies with you. And I'm going to be very blunt and it's probably a little bit vulgar. The people giving out these tests who create these Uh, tests for scoring uh, IQs and gifting and talents and creating Common Core and all the rest of that garbage. The majority, the overwhelming majority of the learning experts with the uh, PhDs in psychology and learning disorders and everything else, to be quite frank, are idiots. Yeah, that's right. They're idiots. They're mental idiots. They're mentally inferior. Because only somebody who's a mental idiot and mentally inferior would look at Albert Einstein and say that Albert Einstein was subnormal. Think of all the kids' lives they're ruining because they can't see a genius when he or she walks in front of them. It's not the kid's problem. It's their problem. They have a mediocre consciousness. And a mediocre consciousness does not have the neurological capacity or the neurological abilities to perceive genius. Because genius is totally foreign to their consciousness. Their consciousness is in the land of mediocrity, stupidity, dullness, sameness, average. Therefore, it's impossible for them to recognize genius and gifting because Genius and gifting is like trying to understand a language which you never learned or were exposed to. If you call yourself an educator or a PhD in whatever, learning disorders or education or evaluating children's minds, but you can't recognize or speak the language of genius and you can't recognize it, it is because your mind is stuck in a below average consciousness. Therefore, you couldn't recognize genius if your life depended on it. And think of all the kids who are called all these horrible names, shamed, laughed at, and made fun, on and on and on. Okay, let's give you some other examples. <clears throat> Another example would be um, scientist, the rocket scientist Robert Goddard who was a childhood hero of mine, because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist. In fact, you will think I'm the ultimate nerd, and I probably am. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. I'm talking about at a very young age. So I read the biographies of all the great nuclear physicists like Einstein and others, and rocket scientists like Robert Goddard, who was one of my heroes. 
And I was so passionate about physics and science. I built a huge laboratory in my bedroom. I was on fire for science. I wanted to be a scientist with everything in me, okay? And then one day in junior high school, I think it was my second year in junior high school, I had to take a class in physics. And the man who was the teacher who taught physics made physics, which I was like on fire with, so passionate about. This teacher made physics so boring, so mundane, and he sucked the life out of it. He took every piece of joy I had in my boyhood heart about being a physicist, and he, he, he literally robbed my soul and turned physics into the most boring, mundane, uh, just lifeless science that, that he, he terrified me. And, and right then and there, because of his classroom, exposed to his teaching, my passion and love for science and physics, he destroyed completely. Now, I believe God allowed it in his will ultimately, but that's what one teacher can do, good or bad. He chose to, to, to destroy my uh, desire to be a scientist. So they made fun of Robert Goddard, my childhood hero, because his peers, his fellow scientists, said that rocket propulsion would not work in the upper atmosphere of outer space. Well, certain kinds of rocket propulsion don't work, but Goddard went on to develop methods of rocket propulsion that did work, and he became one of the fathers of modern rocketry, proving his uh, fellow uh, uh, scientists wrong. The great football coach, Vince Lombardi, he was told other experts in the field of professional football said of Vince Lombardi, quote, he possesses minimal football knowledge and lacks motivation. You see, Lombardi didn't, uh, did not accept that definition of him. He, he, he defied it and went on to be a great in football. He didn't allow the assessment or evaluation of somebody else to determine his future. And we need to be careful with ourselves and our children. It's just on and on you see these stories of great people who went on to do great things. And so many of them were told and re- that they were a failure and dumb and, and, and would never amount to anything. And time after time, these individuals ignored their critics and uh, uh, achieved success that nobody ever believed that they could achieve. So, just something to think about. When, when you, you receive feedback, uh, your child receives feedback, you need to always remember, I mean, it's important to listen to feedback, but you have to be discerning about the feedback. Just because somebody who is an authority figure or, or somebody who has a high-level role in a particular industry and field says you're no good or whatever, <clears throat> you have to really discern whether that's true or not. And if you believe that that person is false and you're not walking in some kind of self-delusion, then you need to completely reject that person's negative beliefs about you and go for it. All right? I remember so many times in life, first of all, I was one of those kids who incessantly daydreamed in class. I remember first grade at PS 69 in Jackson Heights, Queens. Now, again, I loved learning. I was exposed to learning and education. My parents were atheists, artists, but they gave me a rich intellectual life. I knew about lots of things. I read hundreds of books at a young age. I listened to very advanced discussions. I loved knowledge. I loved learning. I loved reading. I loved speaking. I loved writing. I can't say I loved speaking. I was embarrassed uh, to public speak back then. But I remember being in first grade, and I couldn't pay attention because the teacher was so incredibly boring 
It wasn't that I had, it wasn't that I lacked the ability to pay attention. It was that I lacked the ability to pay attention to, to trivia. I couldn't, she was so boring that I literally would look out the window and daydream. So I, I can understand, I mean, I'm not Albert Einstein, but I can understand why he left the room and to get out of the box and let his mind soar. I found the subject matter, it's not that I'm faulting them for trying to give me certain subject matter, but they, they did it in the most mediocre, boring way. And then, of course, the teacher would make fun of me, and you would be ridiculed back then. And I don't remember if I had to sit on a, I think I, I, did, I had to sit on, a, they used to make uh, the class dummy or whatever, uh, sit on a stool in, in one of the four corners of the room. But I think she made me stand in the corner as an act of humiliation or sit on a chair in one of the corners of the room, forcing me to look at her. Yeah, all the kids are laughing at you and mocking you. So what happened to me, immediately, I just I hated school. Couldn't stand it. Um, and could could not pay attention to most of the courses because they were just so incredibly dull. And then certain events began to happen in, in uh, grammar school. One was third grade was a pivotal year. Because when push came to shove, one of our assigned, some of our assigned books were to read Alice Huxley's Brave New World and George Orwell's 1984, which I had read many times privately by myself and read up on it. And I thoroughly understood the content and the meaning and the context of the novels Brave New World and by Huxley and uh, 1984 by George Orwell. Okay, totally understood it. Now, conversely, the teacher had the most incredible lack of understanding. She had no clue as to what those books were about, which was evident when she would talk about them. She, she only was able to gloss over very superficially. Fortunately, I don't know whether another teacher was involved or whatever, Somehow it moved from the teacher's subjective evaluation of me, which was she was looking down upon me. Somehow another measuring factor came into place, and somebody figured out that I knew and understood 1984 and Brave New World at like a very high level, college degree level. And then I knew exactly what I was talking about. And then they changed the grades, and I was given an A-plus in both. That was a pivotal moment in my life, because that was the first time in going to public school that I actually received affirmation. Then other things happened that weren't supposed to happen. Um, we oh, oh, I'll tell you one thing that happened. I found out that... Um, um, that after we took our IQ tests, and I forgot when we took our IQ tests, but after we had all taken our IQ tests, I found out that all of our IQ tests were alpha, in alphabetical order and were locked in the closet of a particular classroom that I had to attend uh, several uh, sessions a day. Now, you may think what I did was wrong. I don't think it was wrong. In fact, if I had to do it over again, I would have done it with a vengeance. They refused to let us know what our, our, our IQs were, which actually, looking back on it now, knowing what I know now, was probably a good thing because, as we discussed in an earlier program, <clears throat> your intelligence is not determined by your, your IQ or DNA. And, and that's prob- people would have read their IQ, and if their IQ was low, they would have thought they were stupid for the rest of their lives because of faulty science. So it was probably a good thing. But I wanted to know how intelligent I was. And I thought it was a violation of every human right that I had to be deprived of the knowledge of knowing what the IQ test said about my intelligence. I mean, I thought it was fundamentally wrong. You may disagree with me. So I waited till she was out of the classroom, 
and whether the, the, the closet was locked or unlocked. Anyway, I, the door opened easily, and I quickly found my name, and I opened my IQ test. My heart's beating like crazy over fear that she's going to come in. And I actually saw what my IQ was, my, my IQ ranking was in terms of intelligence. And um, I didn't know how to process it. Well, let's just say that it was high, uh, very high. But I didn't know how to process it because I didn't know, you know, what did that mean in context to, you know, somebody else or whatever. Where was I in terms of the average or above average? But I remember being uh, disturbed that I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to ask questions. I wasn't allowed to ask how they formulated certain things or whatever. So I just, I, I just felt it was a truth about me that I deserved to know, uh, and that it shouldn't be hidden. Now today, knowing what I know about IQ tests, they probably should be burned. But having said that, that's how important I think you need to have the tools not hidden from you. Because you are a participant in your own growth of intelligence. So why should you be deprived of the so-called knowledge uh, to progress? So uh, fortunately, I didn't get caught, and I kept it to myself. Then, shortly after that, I had to take a, a statewide test. I don't remember what it's called. It's probably called by the same name, I think, in New York or California. It was a statewide test where they assessed your uh, ranking uh, in all different areas. Uh, even though you were in grammar school, they assessed your ranking and your educational level in terms of all the students in the state of New York and New York City uh, in, in every field. And, and that, that included the college level the the you know basic bachelor's degree college level the master's degree college level and the PhD college level so <clears throat> I take the test you know I didn't know if I did good or bad or whatever a few weeks I'd forgotten about it. a few weeks later because I was put deliberately in kind of the below average classroom <clears throat> oh that's one of the reasons I wanted to find out what my IQ was because my IQ was contradictory to the low level I was in in terms of classroom. In other words, I should have been at a much higher level, but I was in a lower level. So when this statewide test came back, it turned out that in certain areas I had a PhD level, and I forgot what the specific uh, categories were. One was literature, reading comprehension. It was basically literary type areas, okay? I had PhD college level, which absolutely shocked the principal and the teachers and the other parents got wind of it and, and the principal and my teacher and whatever, <clears throat> she brought me into her uh, office with this ashen white <clears throat> You know, like when the face is deprived of blood, <clears throat> embarrassed, <clears throat> and and apologize. I don't know what for. Oh, yeah, apologize for putting me in the wrong classroom or whatever. And she was stunned that the, the, the data said this is where I ranked, which was so. It was so far beyond anybody in the school. It was also so far beyond anybody in high school. It was way up towards a PhD level. <clears throat> understanding of, of literature and comprehension and stuff like that. And and so they didn't know what to do with me. Well, the fact of the matter is, I figure it out years later what the problem was. I was very, very gifted in, in certain areas, a lot of areas. They're exceptionally gifted. But I had some Achilles heels. I was terrible in the area of mathematics, specifically. Uh, and so that brought down... You know, it was like I was performing at an ultra high level in literary areas and 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 at a mediocre level in, in mathematical areas. So you know, looking back in retrospective, it really should have been a no brainer because some people are are very good at both. 
But many kids are very good at math, lousy at uh, reading and comprehension. So, I mean, why these ar arbitrary boxes where it's like one size fits all? So anyway, it only increased my frustration. <clears throat> now, one other thing along this line. You, you, the, 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 what I learned is you can never allow somebody else to define you on any level because you define yourself. And that's what you have to do. When, when somebody, see, if I was to believe the things that they said about me, good and bad, I mean, it was nice to hear the good things, but if I had believed the negative things, like when I was put in, in a four, a fourth corner in, in first grade and humiliated and laughed at and essentially treated like I was an idiot, you know, I look back now, I'm the author of 31 books. I've produced several feature films. I've spoken all over the world. I mean, it goes on and on. Now, <clears throat> how did I get there? God's blessing and persistence. Persistence. Persistence more than anything else. Just, my father taught me one thing. He was a, a track runner. He was the second fastest man in the United States of uh, colleges and universities. And he just, he'd, one thing he taught me was never give up. Uh, but he would say it repetitively, never give up and just keep it. No, this is what he said. He said, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And he would repeat it ad nauseum. But he pounded that principle into my brain. Don't give up. And whatever you're doing, just keep at it. Because it's like, if you keep at it and don't give up, it, it will eventually open up for you. And that was a very powerful piece of advice, a, a biblical piece of advice. So, these are the principles you have to instill in your children. Principles from the Word of God. And we have to start with the, the basic fact that we're not here randomly by evolution. There is a God. The school system has got faulty science and faulty data. They say there is no God. They're completely off the, the tracks. There is a God. There's an infinite, personal, living God of the universe. There's a biblical God. He exists. And every one of us are children of God. And every one of us can be saved if we choose to be. And every single one of us have been given gifts and abilities and talents by God. We're made in the image of God. That's the fundamental fact of our reality. So how dare some humanly engineered system designed to enslave and dumb down you, your children, and your grandchildren, how dare we allow that to enter in our life and determine our children's future? Or how intelligent they are? Or how gifted they are? We can't allow that to happen. Because we are responsible for not only ourselves, for our children. So the only way we can overcome this thing, and Jesus wants us to overcome this thing, he tells us we're overcomers and more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, especially in the last days. But part of the way we overcome and conquer is wisdom, knowledge, intelligence, creativity, knowing our gifting. And we can't accept the lie that we're dumb, we don't have any gifts, our life has no meaning. We have to aggressively know the truth, self-educate ourselves, and then impart that to our children. And we can, we've been given the gift by God to re-engineer or backward engineer the dumbing down process. Even though we went through a dumbing down process, we can reverse that because God created our mind in such a way that you can turn it around. You're not the victim of your DNA. You're not the victim of your conditioning. God created our brains and human spirits in such a way that we can quickly rebound. We can quickly get a second chance. We can quickly recapture the gifting, the life, the talents, the abilities, and the vision that God gave us. That's the blessing. That's why we have to know the truth, because the truth shall set us free. But not just truth regarding salvation. That will get you into heaven. But if you're going to be more than a conqueror and overcome in this life, you need to know the truth about how you run your brain, how you activate your brain, how you turn on your talents and abilities, because it's only then that you can be fully functional 
in the last days, whether you're a businessman, whether you're a teacher, a nurse, a salesman, or whatever. Now, it's that truth that we have to do everything in our power to communicate as fast as possible while the windows and the doors of communication are still open. And that's the purpose, one of the primary purposes of Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church. We are seeking to use every uh, media, every social media, every intertechnology possible through film, through video, through television, through books, through articles, uh, through conferences, through the Paradise Mountain Church meetings. We're already exposing millions of people. Uh, every couple of months, we're reaching millions and millions of people all over planet Earth who are tuning into our messages. And why? Because they're, they're different. That's why. They're out of the box. They, they, they activate people. They engage people. We're not using the same old ho-hum approach. Okay? We get people. The one thing I asked the Lord for decades ago, 30 years ago, I said, Lord, allow me to win more people to Jesus Christ. Um, I, and, and then I said, you know, allow me to win the people who are the most turned off by Christianity, the, <clears throat> the hardest to reach, Lord. Let me reach them. And so that's what I'm all about. That's what this ministry is all about. You know, God bless anybody who's reaching anybody for the Lord. But I ask the Lord for the toughest nuts to crack. I want the people who are alienated by Christianity, who who feel like they were lied to and programmed to be dumb. I want I want to give them the truth that they that they that Jesus and principles from the Word and Science can turn it all around. And because of that, people are are, I don't know how they hear about it, word of mouth usually, stumbling across something on the Internet. We impact millions of people. It's mind-blowing. And yet we're a small ministry. And I would say we do it, we have the ability to do this. One, number one, God's favor, God's guidance, God's blessing, God's inspiration. That's number one. Number two, creativity, innovation, and persistence. And finally, because of partnership from people like you, I cannot tell you how thankful I am and how, how nece- necessary it is to know that people are obeying the Lord and are choosing to become passionate intercessory prayer warriors for this ministry, my family, uh, and everything we do in terms of outreach and myself. Thank you. I can't tell you how thankful I am for those of you that take it upon yourself to creatively go around this censorship on the Internet and use your abilities to distribute the information we have far and wide to the people that need to hear it. Thank you for doing that. And I want to thank those of you that go before the Lord with no preconceived ideas and just in childlike faith ask God, how you can help us financially with your donations and contributions, and then for your obedience in being willing to do anything the Lord tells you to do, even if it's unconventional. I want to thank you for being obedient, because it's together, it's in partnership, that we can do this. And today, the burden of my heart was on reaching the children and the grandchildren and even the adults who have been programmed by an evil world system and reaching them with the truth that will set them free. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us.